Hebrews 10.34 You sympathized with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. Wow. You sympathize with those in prison and joyfully accept the confiscation of your property. This describes what happened to Christians, not to the nation of Israel, nor is joyfully accepted confiscation of your property. Wow. What an eternal perspective. The nation of Israel was under God's judgment for unfaithfulness and did not receive confiscation of their property, captivity, or persecution with joy. You sympathize with those in prison and joyfully accepted confiscation of property, this phrase, because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions, refers to the joy of knowing that one has eternal life and will receive eternal rewards in heaven for their sufferings and persecutions. Christians all knew that they had eternal life and were to receive rewards for faithful service. 10.35 Jews of Old Testament times did not all have, or even knew for the most part, that they were destined for the kingdom of heaven with the option of receiving rewards for faithful service. This is talking to the believers, Hebrew Christian believers, for you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your own property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance. Boy, it's going to apply to me. So that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. For yet in a little, very little while, he who is coming will come, and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in them. So this passage in Hebrews is referring to the faith of Christianity, Hebrew Christians, for which, and uh, Gentile Christians, applies to all of uh, those in this dispensation, to the faith of Christianity for which one suffered persecution, not Judaism. The Roman Empire did not usually operate that way toward the Jews, except in times of uprisings and conquest. Did the Jew receive persecution from the Romans? Therefore, these verses further affirm that the writer of Hebrews is addressing professing Hebrew Christians, for the most part, with a few passages aimed at false professors of true faith in Christ. Moving on to 35 to 36. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. Zane Hodges states, This was no time for them then to throw away their confidence as the author's exposition of the eternal inheritance, the glory of the many sons had sought to show that confidence, if retained, will be richly rewarded. I always thought for my Christian life, I'm going to get all these rewards. Now I see how much more you need to persevere. Verse 36, so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. Persevere refers to walking by faith under trials, suffering and persecution, so that one will receive what he has promised, not eternal life. For that is by a one-time expression of faith alone in Christ alone, and not by perseverance. but for eternal rewards in heaven. Spoke to a couple of, I think they were Jehovah's Witnesses. And uh, we talked about what it takes to get to heaven. 
don't know if they were or not. Maybe they wouldn't have responded the way they did. And they're going all over the place and said, no, 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 no. How about John 1, 12 to 14? I think it's John 1, 12. Yeah. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So that, that is that is to say. So as many as received, the words received means to believe. Who were born thereby, having believed in his name, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but born of God. And they say, well, yeah, but there's more to believing just than just believing. I didn't know. I thought the dictionary says believing is believing. Having faith. Trusting it. Accepting is true. That's my radio. I argue with them because there's a great passage, 1 John 5, 9 through 13. <clears throat> if we accept the testimony of God, accept the testimony of man, the testimony of God is greater. And this is the testimony of God. 1 John 5, 9 through 13. It's a great proof text that defines faith, saving faith. Oops. <clears throat> if we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater, for the testimony of God is this, that he has testified concerning his Son, the one who believes in the Son of God has this testimony in himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar, and because he has not believed in the testimony of God that, it, that God has given concerning his Son. So here's the deal. Accepting the testimony of somebody, or what they have said about something, means believe. Now, is there anything else you have to do? Well, these two guys in the trolley yesterday said, well, yeah, you have to be faithful, you have to do this, you have to do that. Of course, I wanted to ask, but they shut me down. I mean, a lot of people like, like to throw a million things at you and you never get a chance to answer one. I always say, can I finish? No. Can I answer? No. So you ask, a conversa what kind of conversation is this? It's, I get a gag order. But believing is just accepting something as true. It may not be true. But the testimony of God about his son, I find it's pretty true because I find no errors in scripture. And it's a pretty good idea, because nobody else is going to guarantee eternal life, but God, our Creator, and Him alone. But they said, we'll pray for you. I said, would you want to come with us to our church? I said, no, you don't have the gospel. Why would I want to go there? They don't want to accept the simple idea of what believing means. They want to take believing, saving faith, includes everything including the kitchen sink. In any case, you need to persevere on that matter. What the readers needed, therefore, was just what the writer had often said and implied. To, to persevere, in other words, literally, you had need of perseverance. So that by this, thus doing God's will, they would receive what God had promised. As much as anything, these words express the central exhortation of the book of Hebrews. Persevering in the faith. Boy, do I need to do that. But I'm not so used to getting through some difficulty in life. And it's just getting older. Somebody arguing with me on the trolley. And they leave and they condemn me or they get a little irritating. I can get through that all right. These Hebrew Christians were going through some difficulty, as did the first century believers in Thessalonia. Wow. First, uh, in Hebrews 10, 37 to 39, for in just a little, very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. St. Hodges says, if their concern due to the persecution 
verse 33, was about the delay of the second advent, and 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 First Thessalonians, um, uh, Thessalonians, they were concerned too. They well, gee, what? Um, the rapture's already come. What what's going on there? They were concerned about that. They should rest assured that in just a little, very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. These words and those that follow were adapted by the author from the Septuagint of Isaiah 26:21 and Habakkuk 2, 3 to 4. But they were used freely and were not intended as a precise quotation since no words such as he, has, he says introduced them. And verse 38, but my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. But my righteous one will live by faith. It refers to a believer. Because you're declared righteous when you become a believer by God. Not by your actual experience, but by God's declaration. Which then will become true in your resurrection body. But so far as salvation is concerned, you're righteous because you have the righteousness of Christ credited to your account. There's one who has been declared righteous unto eternal life, having placed his faith alone in God's plan of salvation, through his Son, Jesus Christ, alone. An individual is then declared righteous by God, the only way one can get to be righteous. So Hebrews 10.38 states, The one who is declared righteous will live eternally by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. So there's an option, but it doesn't mean you've lost your salvation. Some people take this verse, uh, live by faith, one will live by faith, and say, yeah, if you don't live by faith, then you don't have eternal life. No. The righteous one who will live eternally by faith has this, the possibility in his temporal life of shrinking back from the will of God. That's what it says in 36. In the face of persecution, in the face of persecution, and at which time the Lord indicates his displeasure. Notice that loss of salvation is not a view. Careful, careful reading. We must read carefully. Notice. Alternative. But. If he shrinks back, that is, if the righteous one, declared righteous because of a moment of faith in Christ, if the righteous one commits apostasy, denouncing his Christian profession, God's favor cannot rest on this his life. That's favor. Doesn't mean you haven't received eternal life. By understanding the serious consequences, the writer softened his words so that he could, would not distract from his predominant role of encouragement. Verse 39. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. Now here the original text as an emphatic we, which the writer might have intended as an additional editorial we, of which he was quite fond of, then he would mean, as far as I'm concerned, I am determined not to shrink back and experience the ruin which divine retribution would bring. The words are destroyed, reflect the Greek apollonia, which can refer either to temporal or eternal ruin. Now, I just have a thought here. These are encouraging words but difficult words for me. I don't want to lose out in eternity so much. I'm not led a perfect life as a Christian, but I don't want to lose everything. Eternal ruin. Now that means you're in eternity in the kingdom of God, but your life, your temporal life is ruined, the value of your eternity to a great extent, and you won't enjoy it. And you're facing that much. You're facing an eternity where it could have been so much greater 
and you just persevered in the faith.